energy. Energy. Mm-hmm. On that resurrection morning, with the redeemed are gathering in, I'll be in that royal number when they call my name. When they all join in and sing, Hallelujah to the King. I'll cry with the joyful sound, Lord, here I am, here I am, here I am. I'm the one the shepherd left, the fall and found. There were ninety and nine, but he left the fold to find. to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I have a friend that I went to college with and uh, he's gotten into uh, studying how Jesus interacted with people. I thought that might be a good study for us to look at in the Gospels. And so today we're going to look at uh, how Jesus interacted with these first five uh, converts that are mentioned here in his ministry. And we're going to look at this today. I'll ask you to stand if you're able. And we'll look at John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. Beginning of verse 35. Again the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, 
Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we see these wonderful words in the scripture. Come and see. Come and see. We pray that you would just impress those words on our hearts today by your Holy Spirit. And help us to see that Jesus is saying to a lost and dying world, Come and see. Come and see. Help us to say to a lost and dying world, Come and see. Come and see. Be with this preacher today. Fill him with your Holy Spirit. Guide him and lead him in what he ought to say and what he ought not to say. Do your work, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You know, as we think about it, most people, most people have a public and a private side to them. You know, we think about people taking on a persona on television. And uh, in real life, that person that you watch on the TV or on the internet, it's on YouTube or in the movies, may be totally different than what he or she is like in their role on television. I think about Bill Cosby. I grew up in the 1980s, and I remember watching The Cosby Show. It was the number one show. And I think, you know, I really enjoyed that show when I was growing up, and I think a lot of the things I've learned about parenting, you know, have come from The Cosby Show. And that's why Bill Cosby wanted to uh, do that show, is he had an idea about how you ought to parent with your children, and he wanted to teach it to others. Uh, you go to a thrift store, and you'll probably see a book by Bill Cosby called Fatherhood. I never read the book. But you think about him, and then you find out later that throughout his career, he was drugging women, and he was raping women, and taking advantage of women. And you think, well, here's what he was, you know, Huxtable, you know, Dr. Huxtable on the TV show. And yet in person, he was a totally different character, the double life. But unlike most people, Jesus always has a welcoming and transparent spirit toward those who want to sincerely know more about him. And we see this welcoming and transparent spirit Spirit, when Jesus says, come and see, come and see. We see some characters here. First character we see in John chapter 1 is the faithful preacher, the faithful preacher. It says, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. You know, John had said the exact same thing the day before. If you look at verse number 29, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You know, we see earlier in the chapter, verse 15, John bare witness of Christ, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Verse 23. John said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, 
as said the prophet Isaiah. So here's John the Baptist. He's saying, Behold, the Lamb of God. Here is the sacrifice that God has set for our sins. The day before, Behold, the Lamb of God. The day before that, you know, I am just a voice of one making straight or making clear, clearing out the pathway so that the Lord can come. Saying, there's one coming after me who's greater than me. He knows God better than anybody else because he's been with God and now he's been made flesh and he's come to earth. What do we see here as we look at the faithful preacher, John the Baptist? We see that we, like John, ought to be consistently telling others about the perfect and only sacrifice for their sins, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul did. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2. He said, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so we see here, consistently telling others about Christ and what He has done for their souls. The faithful preacher. We see next the faithful Savior. The faithful Savior. Verse number 37. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And this could have been under the faithful preacher as well, but two of John's disciples listened to John as he was talking about Jesus, and they left John, and they followed Christ. It says that Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? What seek ye, Jesus said. In other words, what are you all looking for? What you looking for? You know, a lot of people were looking for Jesus. You know, you had King Herod. And uh, when Jesus appeared before King Herod, when Pilate let him appear before King Herod, King Herod just wanted to see Jesus work a miracle. You see, the crowds after the feeding of the 5,000, they just wanted some more bread and fish. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers, and they wanted to see Jesus to try to trip him up and catch him in his words. There are a lot of people who wanted to see Jesus. But these two here, they said, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? Thou. What are you looking for? Jesus asked. And they replied, we're looking for you. We simply want to be with you. Now Jesus didn't always answer this way. Look at it back in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. <clears throat> there are a lot of reasons why people are looking for Jesus. Matthew 8, verse number 19 it says, And a certain scribe came and said unto him, unto Jesus, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. In verse number 20, Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. <laughs> What's Jesus trying to do here to the scribe? He's trying to discourage the scribe. You don't know what you're getting into, scribe. I don't know what you think my ministry is like, Jesus is saying to him. But we sleep on the streets. We have nowhere in particular that we lay our head. We don't have a regular home that we stay in. And I would say most likely that scribe took Jesus' hint and did not follow Jesus. So the question is, why is it, in verse number 38 of chapter 1, you know, Jesus is going to say, come and see, <laughs> to these two disciples. And yet, in this other passage, Jesus tries to discourage him and says, I don't have any place for you to go to. <laughs> you know, I can't, I, can't, I can't put you up, in other words. Well, the difference is, when Jesus asked the question, what seek ye? Jesus did not ask that question for his own knowledge. 
You see, when Jesus asks a question, he's like a teacher in one of your classes. Your teacher asks you a question. Okay, who was the first president of the United States? You're not going when he asks that question. Why, you're the dumbest teacher around. <laughs> you don't know who the president of the United States is? You know, why is a history teacher first president? By the way, it's George Washington. But anyway, the history teacher is not asking because he doesn't know the answer. He's asking because he wants to bring the answer out of you. And whenever Jesus asks a question, he's wanting the people he's asking the question to to formulate in their mind the answer and to solidify in their heart why, why, or whatever the question may be. And so, but Jesus knows what's in their heart. And so when they say, we want to be where you are, Jesus, he says, come and see. He didn't put them off. He says, come at once and you'll find what you're looking for. This is a gracious invitation. Come. And a promise. See. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And what did they do? Well, it says here, it says, They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. They came, they saw, and they remained. They lingered. They listened, they believed, and they were saved. So we see here the faithful preacher, the faithful savior. Next we see the faithful brother, the faithful brother. Verse number 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. A couple of thoughts here. There are two men here. One of the men was identified as who? Andrew. Andrew. The other one is unnamed. And what most people believe is that unnamed person is the writer of this gospel, John. John the Beloved. And so the other person was likely John. Because many times in the gospel, John makes allusion to himself, you know, the disciple that Jesus loved, <laughs> You know, things like that, but doesn't want to bring glory to himself, and so he doesn't say his own name. So most likely, we don't know for certain, this is Andrew and John. But the important person here is Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now this is kind of an interesting thing, because how do you like to go through life being known as so-and-so's brother? <laughs> I guess Bill is Jason's older brother, right? I don't know if anybody ever said, oh, you're, Jay you're Bill's brother. <laughs> But that's one of the curses of having an older brother or an older sister. Well, you're so-and-so's brother. You're so-and-so's sister. And so Andrew seems in the scripture to play second fiddle to his brother Peter. But you know what? Humanly speaking, there would have been no Peter if it hadn't have been for Andrew. Let's look at this. It says here in verse number 40, and one of the two heard John, which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. Now this is just kind of a side note, but you notice here it says, which being interpreted is. This is the second time we've seen this. And some people believe that the reason that John wrote that it's because John's gospel was for the whole world. And some people would not have known the Jewish terminology, rabbi or messiah. And so his audience would understand what he was saying. He translated it into master, which means teacher, and uh, Christ, which means messiah. But anyway, it says he first. This is the first thing that Andrew did. It was a top priority for Andrew. And what was that first thing that he did? It says, He findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah. 
the first thing he did, first priority. I remember years ago, it would be years ago now, when Trey made a profession of faith. One of the first things he did was he wanted his brother John to be saved. Now, you know, that's just a, a wonderful thing for a parent to see someone making a profession of faith and then having a burden for their brother. And so you could say that, uh, you know, any fruit that God may bring to John's life in some way will also be rewarded in Trey's life because of that burden that he had for his brother. Yeah, that ought to be a first priority for us. Our first priority as a Christian should be to bring our family to Jesus. It says here in verse number 42, he went, he found his brother Simon, he said, we found the Messiah, and he brought him to Jesus. How can we bring our family members to Jesus? Someone once said that family members are often the hardest people to bring to Christ. And maybe the reason for that is because of this first way in which we bring our family members to Jesus. Number one, we bring our family members to Jesus by living out Jesus in front of our family members. Uh-oh. <laughs> if we're a bad testimony in front of our family members... And really, no one knows us best but our spouse, our brothers, our sisters, the family that we're comfortable with and we hang around. Number one, we need to live out our Christian testimony in front of our family. Number two, we need to share Jesus with our family by giving them the scriptures and by inviting them to the local church. So I can hear the preaching and teaching of God's word and hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. We found the Messiah. We have found the anointed one. We have found the one that God has chosen before the foundation of the world to be the sacrifice for our sins like old John the Baptist talked about who is coming to save us from our sins. And the first thing Andrew did was go tell his brother Peter. Look at Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> Acts chapter 16. Beginning of verse 25. We see a marvelous conversion here. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So here they are. They're thrown into the deepest dungeon They've been beaten, and now they're singing praise to God, and they're praying to God. It says that suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands was loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, do thyself no harm, for we're all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out. Now remember, what have they been doing all night? Singing praises, probably singing the Psalms. What have they been doing all night? Praying. Probably not just praying for their own deliverance. Perhaps they were, perhaps they weren't. But probably praying that they might be a good testimony in front of all these prisoners and perhaps even... They were heard praying for this prison keeper. And so he comes out and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. If the members of your household believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved as well. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all 
his house. After this miraculous conversion, the Philippian jailer wanted nothing more than to see his family know Jesus as Savior as well. And as I think about this jailer, I especially speak to the men who are here. And that is, as the heads of our home, as those who, by nature, set the pace in our homes, we need to be the ones to live out that testimony consistently before our family members. And we need to be the ones sharing the word with our family members that they might know Christ and might be saved. Because on the day when you look into the coffin of someone who is your flesh and blood, you'll never regret telling them about Jesus or even having the privilege of bringing them to Jesus. Well, who is this convert that a Andrew went and brought to Jesus? Well, it says here, when Jesus beheld him, verse 42 of chapter 1 of John, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas. You know, that's one name I don't hear much. Cephas. You know anybody named Cephas? I don't know if you do or not. Uh, Cephas. What does it mean? It means a stone or a rock. Uh, throughout the Bible, we see God sometimes changing a person's name in order to show that that person himself had radically changed. Abram became Abraham. Jacob became Israel. Saul became Paul. These are examples of this taking place. Well, here, he says, your name was Simon. And I wish I knew what Simon meant. Maybe I've studied that at some point. But I know what Cephas means. And it means the same thing that Peter means. And that is a rock. Or a stone. Here's Peter. A solid rock. <laughs> a stone. What do we see Peter doing in Acts chapter 2? In Acts chapter 2, we see Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. It says in verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, Hearken unto my words. And he goes on and he gives them the gospel. Then he gives the invitation. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The day of Pentecost. Humanly speaking, and we see Peter going on. He was the one that had the keys to the kingdom. So he opened up salvation to the Jews. He opened up salvation to the Samaritans. He opened up salvation to the Gentiles when he preached at Cornelius' house. Here he is. He has the keys to the kingdom. And humanly speaking, there may never have been a Peter without a faithful Andrew. You know, that's how I pray for my kids. I pray, Heavenly Father, Make their walk with you greater than my walk. Do greater things in and through their lives than you've ever done in mine. And so Andrew was a humble fellow. Someone said he's always bringing people to Jesus. There's one time I think he brought some Greeks to see Jesus, some Greek people that were there. Always bringing people to Jesus, Andrew. You know, we may never preach and see thousands saved as Peter did. But God may use us to reach the one who will. And that is what we learn from Andrew and Peter. So we've seen the faithful preacher. We've seen here the faithful Savior, the faithful brother, 
And now we see the faithful friend. Verse number 43. The day following, the next day, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Here we're introduced to a common phrase that Jesus would use to call people unto himself. Follow me. Follow me. You see, what this shows us is that true belief, true faith, always results in following Christ. We cannot say we trust Christ if we do not have a desire to follow Christ. And remember that as we're going through in Sunday school, the book of 1 John, over and over and over again, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. He that does not righteousness is not righteous. It doesn't mean you're perfect. But it means there's a desire to follow Christ and to please God if you're one of God's children. So we see here, verse number 44. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael. So Jesus found Philip and said, follow me. And so Philip is now following Jesus' example by doing what? Going and finding his friend Nathanael. And it says here, Philip findeth Nathanael, verse 45, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of of Joseph. We have found him. We have found the one that the Old Testament has told us was going to come. The Messiah, the anointed one. And you see, just as a side note, you know, sometimes people look at children and they say, well, these children, they don't understand the Bible. Why well, try teaching it to them? Well, I'm sure up to this point, Nathaniel didn't understand that Jesus was the Messiah. But once Philip talked to Nathaniel, all those scriptures that Nathaniel had faithfully put in his heart, they all came to light as he's getting ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, yeah, it says he'd be born in Bethlehem. That's where he was born. Yeah, it says, you know, yeah, it says. It says in the Old Testament, Oh, wow. All of these Old Testament scriptures are fulfilled in Jesus. He had hidden God's word in his heart. And through that word, he was about to be born again. It says, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, I want 